So the first thing I want to think about, and this is of course so um, normal for us to expect that when we think about desire, we think about the body, right? We cannot imagine a desire that is divorced from the body. We cannot imagine a desire that is not anchored in some way, shape or form by the idea of the human body. And so what's interesting to think about uh, across multiple traditions in, in the Indian subcontinent is that the body actually is not the only or even the primary locus of desire. And so if we begin with certain Hindu, Hindu traditions and the god of love, um, Kama, in, in various guises, various iconographic forms, um, Kama is actually, uh, when you use the word embodies love, that's actually exactly the wrong word to use because Kama doesn't have a body. And this is his entire specialty or USP, his, his sort of being in the world. Because legend has it that he goes up to Shiva who is deep in meditation having renounced the world and saying I don't want to have anything to do with anybody. And he is trying to, Kama is trying to lure him out of that meditation because the gods, and we're going to be speaking about the pantheon of Hindu gods a lot today, uh, the gods as always up to no good, up to mischief, up to you know, various forms of skullduggery, um, have sent Kama to lure Shiva out of his penance, out of his meditation because they need him uh, to produce a child for, for various reasons that, that I'll talk about later. And so Kama goes and with this uh, bow and the arrow of flowers, shoots an arrow at Shiva and disturbs his penance, distracts him from his meditation. And Shiva um, opens his third eye, his famous third eye, and is so furious at being disturbed at his meditation that he burns Kama to a cinder and reduces him to ashes. And then Parvati comes running out and says, what have you done? How can you kill Kama? He was just trying to help you. He was trying to help us. He was trying to help the world, the gods had sent him, he wasn't doing it on his own. And so Shiva relents and says, okay, I let him live, but he will not have a body. And so all our tales of desire relating to karma are all separated from the idea of a body. And so this is one of the first things that I want to start talking about today, that we have to try and inhabit a worldview in which desire is not necessarily located in the body. That, so in other words then, that desire does not automatically translate into acts of genital intercourse. That desire does not automatically translate into the exchange of bodily fluids. It certainly can, but it does not have to. And so just one very sort of early thing we can say about that is that it expands the palette of our desire multifold. We don't have to think only about bodies any longer, right? We can think about chairs, we can think about plants, we can think about buildings, we can think about ideas. And in fact, I'm very interested in what it means to desire ideas and to think about ideas in terms where we only think about bodies right now, right? So karma is an early and enduring example about how a lot of what are called now Hindu traditions in India uh, separate actually desire from the body. Uh, this is a very modern idea, uh, psychoanalysis in the 20th century, most famously under Sigmund Freud, uh, also says desire is not limited to the body or to genital acts in the body. And so this was, you know, uh, this is about 15, 16 centuries after we have the first mentions of karma. And so the idea of the bodiless desire or desire being far bigger than what the body can anchor is something that we've actually been used to for a long time. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.